Hey everyone, this is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology. Today we're going to take a look at Mars's upcoming trine to Neptune in the sign of Pisces. This is occurring just before Mars makes its opposition to Pluto. We've spent some time already this week looking at Mars opposite Pluto. Honestly, we'll probably look at it again because it is one of the more significant transits of the year happening right before the election, probably signifying some of those October surprises that we see in the news around this time of year, election year. It's pretty common to have a little bit of drama right before the election. I've been saying this for a while, but I suspect that this is probably one of the more dynamic and intense transits of 2024. Um, one of the really interesting parts about this development of Mars opposite Pluto is that right before it happens, Mars in Cancer will trine Neptune in Pisces. So I want to look at this combination today because it's coming through over the weekend just prior to the... Um, the upcoming opposition. So I'm going to show you the timeline and talk to you today about some of the themes that are common for the combination of Mars and Neptune. Uh, so that will be our agenda for today. Remember to like and subscribe. It really helps us grow the channel. We appreciate your support. Uh, we are trying to get to 80,000 subscribers on this channel by the spring equinox. And so uh, helping us out means so much to us. It helps us grow our business and community. You can find transcripts of any of these daily talks on the website, which is nightlightastrology.com. I'm going to take you over to the website right now for today's promotion before we get started. And that is very simply, go to the courses page, click on the first year course. By the way, if you're brand, brand new to astrology, try the Astrology for Beginners recorded course. That is for people who are like really starting at zero. But if you have a little bit of experience already, our next program, Ancient Astrology for the Modern Mystic, our first year course in Ancient Hellenistic Astrology, begins on November 16th. You can learn more about the program after I sign off today. There's an informational video I've tagged on to all videos during enrollment season so that after the regular content is over, if you want to learn more about the program, you can stick around. You can take advantage of our need-based tuition which is there for people, allows you to pick your tuition within a sliding scale. That is there to make sure that people aren't priced out. If you're experiencing financial hardship or you're on a very limited or tight budget, we don't want people to put themselves in harm's way and you know extend beyond their means to take uh, a course that is um, really should be accessible for everyone because we believe this is a, a sacred language that should generally be very accessible to learn. Um, so that's a big part of our mission at Nightlight. So check out need-based tuition. If it will help you, we're glad that it is there and um, that it, it has benefited many people over the years who otherwise wouldn't have been able to study. So, all right, that's it for promotions. Let's take a look at the real-time clock and let's go. Here we are. Now, uh, we can see right here, this is Sunday, October 27th. We're seeing Mars moving into the trine with Neptune. This is Mars in Cancer culminating in that fi those final degrees of Cancer, uh, moving into the opposition with Pluto shortly. You can see that opposition forming just within about two degrees as Mars makes the trine with Neptune. So I am going to talk today about Mars-Neptune themes, and I will say a few things about how I believe they may be connected to Mars-Pluto themes. But one thing to notice is that the Mars-Pluto opposition coming off from the trine to Neptune will occur here. And this is November 3rd. So it is, uh, yeah, just about a week later after the trine that we get the opposition. So they're connected. And I'll say a few things about how I think they might be connected. Um, but let's talk about Mars-Neptune as an archetypal combination. There are five themes. You know, I like my list of five. Number one, when Mars and Neptune get together, you can expect that there will be sacred missions that arrive in your life somehow. By sacred mission, I usually mean that there is a sense of larger uh, emotional uh, and sometimes political or religious or philosophical um, motivation behind the need or desire to take action, to advocate for something, to stand up for something, to do something courageous on behalf of something bigger that sense of something bigger and transcendental, whatever it may be, whatever kind of cause or mission or vision it may be is typically Neptunian and the urge to fight or act or protect or advocate or do something on behalf of it is Mars-like. Now, when the two come into a trine with one another, 
it's nice because these energies can work together a little bit more harmoniously and you'll often see some natural flowing harmonious way in which things are connecting and so mars neptune connecting in this way may be a little less like beating the 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 war drum you know it's it it doesn't have to be as polarized or as polarizing um it, I, I don't see like warriors with you know blood-soaked faces running into the battlefield necessarily with a mars trying to neptune but we do have mars opposite pluto in the mix of this which makes it a little complicated and in, in which case we do have some interesting ways in which a sacred mission could take on a much more violent and eruptive and cathartic and polarizing effect that's what makes it a little tricky Mars trying Neptune, I would often see with, you know, someone taking up um, a mission or a purpose that feels sacred to them, but that has a, a, a fluid and kind of harmonious quality behind it. It's not as agitated and polarized as, say, a Mars Neptune opposition might be. But add the Mars Pluto opposition in, and you get the idea of people whose political or religious zeal or some kind of emotional fanaticism could drive them to do very violent or uh, destructive things because we also have that Mars opposing Pluto. That's when it gets a little problematic. Now, personally, I think that we have to be careful of uh, letting our feelings and a kind of emotional intensity and reactivity lead us into, uh, you know, the power struggles that are not healthy or actions or choices or reactions that are very explosive and dramatic and maybe severe those are the things to be careful of it also isn't a bad thing if you are feeling the need to take some strong actions based on some strong emotional convictions that's okay under this transit i would say just be careful that you're not burning bridges or harming yourself or you know doing something that you can't live with later Number two are martyrs. Now, there's obviously the, the word Mars and the word martyr share roots etymologically, if I'm not mistaken. And so uh, the willingness to die on behalf of something is very Mars-Neptune. Mars in its fall opposing Pluto trining Neptune could lead to some very intense acts of martyrdom, the willingness to die for something. Now, let's just say that you know, in the most extreme cases, that could be literal. But for most of us, that will be figurative or metaphorical, not literal, which means that we will be compelled to fall on the sword metaphorically for something or for someone. Um, and there could also be ways in which we think about martyrdom as an unhealthy complex, like a martyr complex, we say. That's a, a phrase we use to describe someone who maybe is overly self-sacrificing or overly self-sacrificial. So we probably want to avoid becoming a martyr in the negative sense. And we want to um, pay attention to the things and people that we feel the urge to uh, sacrifice for or on behalf of. Um, so what kinds of causes are we willing to sacrifice something on behalf of? these could be very strong motivations and potentially problematic or potentially engaging us in conflicts or power struggles or very intense life and death you know kind of critical scenarios uh, energetic intensity healing crises these are these would be common for us to see or experience ourselves or see in someone else and then uh, some choice or some act of sacrifice or compassionate and charitable um, intervention or, or something like that could come about in the midst of it. And that's kind of combining that Mars trying Neptune with Mars opposite Pluto. All right. So delusional violence. This is basically saying that with Mars opposite Pluto trining Neptune, you could see people who are um, having fantasies delusions of grandeur, you know, in, in, intoxicated and, um, you know, unclear states of consciousness or even uh, in, unbalanced or unwell or sick or, um, you know, just delusional. 
that are very fluidly, which is the problem of a trine, not everything fluidly connected is necessarily good. Like for example, I was the, the classic example with a connection, a trine with something in which is Jupiterian trines are, is that you you don't really want a, a tumor to experience a, a trine with a symbol of growth behind it, right? <laughs> it's like smooth and easy progress for a tumor is not necessarily a good thing. Well, a fallen Mars trining Neptune, smooth and easy uh, inflation of um, delusional thinking and violent, agitated, um, you know, emotional reactions, then the opposition to Pluto can lead to something like delusional acts of violence. Now let's take that down a notch and say delusional acts of um, bullying or willpower or dramatic conflicts that are unnecessary being fueled by emotional fanaticism within our relationships. Do you see what I mean? So you can take that down a notch and just watch for the tendency to get swept up in emotions and engaged in conflicts that are very dramatic and sort of explosive. And you want to be careful of that, honestly. And some conflicts are worth having, right? You may have to, there's certain conflicts that are a part of our growth that we have to face things. And that's a Mars Pluto thing too, facing your fear. And with Neptune behind us, it might be that we have some emotional conviction that's helping us to face a fear. That would be a really nice expression. I mentioned this through the second note on my list, which was uh, martyrs. And I said, there could be some theme of sacrifice. Sacrificial acts is slightly different in that we may be compelled to put money into something. And it's sacrificial because we know it's an investment and we, we know that it's going to stretch us a little bit. A lot of the times, and that's just an example, but a lot of the times when we know something is worth effort and sacrifice and determination will, you know, we'll sort of cut a little, put a little skin in the game. We'll cut a little skin off of ourselves metaphorically. The universe through so many ancient traditions runs on sacrifice. That there's a way in which the universe is like a boiling cauldron that's like eating and cooking itself. As it churns out life, it is naturally sort of destroying and eroding its own essence in order to recreate itself. Ancient people observed this, physicists sort of observed this in different ways too, you know, so it's, it's interesting. It's not an easy reality to live with, I don't think, but when we consider that anything worth creating requires that we're, that we burn something. I mean, I think about this very literally every day with my, my very amateurish hobby of, of bodybuilding. And I have a coach who's a bodybuilder and a professional bodybuilder and so forth. And I've learned so much about the science of nutrition and uh, this, you know, the, the mind muscle connection and so many different movements I've learned. And, but I realize every day I'm in there. And even when I have to practice eating foods where I'd, I'd rather eat something a lot saltier, you know, <laughs> like a, more sweets or whatever, like a, the diet is very clean. Um, and, and the sleep patterns have to be dialed in. And there's a way in which to feel as good as I think we want to feel in any kind of fitness endeavor, we, we have to burn a little. You know, that's like a part of it. Even in yoga, like I, we had a yoga studio for a decade. Practicing yoga is a kind of act of sacrifice. Practicing meditation is a kind of act of sacrifice. Practicing art or writing on days when you don't want to, but you better because when the muse shows up, it shows up and you never know when it's going to happen. So you better sit your butt down and, and do your practice. You know, there's an element of sacrifice involved in anything that is worthwhile. I wonder what kind of tremendous moments of catharsis are in front of us right now because we recognize what kind of heroic sacrifice something requires of us. If we want to really experience the creative potential within us or within something, we recognize I better put some skin in the game. I better throw a little ghee on the fire. So what is that sacrificial act that is being asked of us right now? And again, how much is appropriate? There could be a tendency to sacrifice too much. Uh, and, you know, we want to be careful of that, obviously. And then finally, one of the most charitable ways of looking at Mars-Neptune contacts is through the kind of heroic act of compassion. You think, for example, of those bodhisattvas who refuse to enter nirvana because until all sentient beings are freed from suffering, they will continue to incarnate and do that compassionate, heroic work. You know, I love that story. It's very, in, from grew up in the Christian church. I feel that in essence, the mythology of Christianity, if you want to call it that, unless you're obviously, if you're, I don't mean any insult to anyone, wherever you may be at religiously, if you take it 
as a literal story or if you or if you do not um the story of christ is also a story of heroic compassionate redemption right that's very mars neptune um so mars neptune has this sense of sacrifice forgiveness compassion uh courageous acts of compassion even um and the charitable response when something happens and something in you says i'm going to donate to that hurricane relief fund i don't have the money but it doesn't matter those people have nothing you know it's it's that that's mars neptune mars neptune running into mars pluto could be quite a cathartic act of charity or giving for example and this is a really I, I like you know i like extreme sort of caricatures because i think they help but i don't want people to get freaked out but like let's just say someone that you knew suddenly was in need of an organ a kidney i don't know donating an organ to someone who's going to die without one would be very mars trying neptune mars opposite pluto at the same time are most of us going to run into needing to donate an organ no right but you get the idea so, all right, I'm going to end things here for today. I hope that this has given us, as always, given us um, solid themes archetypally to consider and bring into our consciousness as these symbols and their interactions pass through our linear time space container. Um, I hope you're all doing well. These are intense energies. We have an intense mars pluto opposition a lot i think a lot more to talk through about that opposition been trying to kind of prep us for it because uh, again i think it's one of the biggest transits of of our year as we're coming to the end of the year here so i'll leave it there we'll talk to you again tomorrow you can find um informational content about the upcoming program that starts on november 16th after i sign off i hope you're having a good day bye hey everyone I'm glad that you're sticking around to hear more about the year one program that's coming up. The program starts on November 16th of this fall, and I am here today to tell you all that the program includes and why I think you really like it if you're thinking about studying astrology. So a few practical details about the course as well. The class begins November 16th, as I mentioned, but it takes place on Saturdays from 12 to about 2 or 3 p.m. Eastern time. So that's 11 to 2 central. And typically classes are about two hours long. Sometimes they run over with Q&A and discussion, but you can always plan for about two hours and you won't miss any of the actual lecture content for the day. You may have to duck out a little early if Q&A or discussion is extending. Sometimes it does, which is why we say between two and three hours, but typically it's around two. All of the classes are recorded, so if you can't attend live, you are more than welcome to watch the recordings at your own pace and on your own time. You have life, lifetime access to the recordings, and everything is housed on a student website. I want to actually give you a um, just a little preview of what that student website looks like. So I am going to open up my own version of Thinkific which is the platform that we use. So here's are some of my courses. These are all the nightlight courses I teach. You can see on the page, but I'm going to tune into, let's go to nightlight 28, which is the section that began in June of 2024. So here you're going to see that we have uh, orientation instructions, course information, class links and calendar, everything you need to know how to access the course is there. And you'll have a version of this in your own panel that you get set up with when you enroll. Um, and then our lessons are laid out. So lesson one, we have the video, the audio, the slides, the transcript. We have the Q&A box transcript so you can see what people were saying in the chat box during class. We have flashcards. We have a workbook. We have planet and sign glyph flashcards. We have bonus material, um, videos that we like from YouTube that we link you to. Say, check this video out, check that video out. They go along with some of the things we talked about in class. So every lesson has material for you to go as far as you want with, but the main thing is the video, audio, slides, transcript, et cetera, are all listed there so that you can download and watch it on your own time if you can't attend live. Again, the live classes do happen on Saturdays for this cohort starting November 16th. That is our first day of class. And then um, going forward, it always meets on Saturdays and we give you the class schedule to map out and the breaks that we have, the study sessions that we have, everything's mapped out on the class calendar for you. Uh, so 
Um, so those are just a few practical details that, um, you know, just to kind of start us off with. So I'm going to take you over to the website, which is nightlightastrology.com. And I'm going to share with you some information about the program and sort of walk you through what it includes and what you can expect. So it is an almost year long program. We typically finish between 10 and 11 months out of the year. Uh, it can depend a little bit on some of my teaching and scheduling because sometimes I teach at conferences and it may delay some of our, our modules by a week or something like that. But it's typically around 10 to 11 months that the program lasts. So we call it our first year program. At Nightlight, we have a uh, program for absolute beginners. You may want to check that out if you are like brand spanking new. That would be eight to 10 hours of content that's really meant to set you up for the first year course. We sort of assume that if you're coming into the first year program, you already know a little bit about astrology. For example, you have some familiarity with the signs, planets, and houses. Maybe you know what aspects are, but you want to learn more about what they are. But um, if you are really at the very total entry level space, then try astrology for beginners. And when you take that, uh, you could do that right away and then join the first year course in November and you'd be perfectly set up for it. But anyhow, in this program, over the course of about a year, we work through 30 lessons that I lead. And those lessons are all two to three hours each, including lecture, a little break and a Q&A portion where we open up for people to come on mic and camera and ask questions and have an interactive discussion about the material for the day. The program is broken into modules that cover a variety of topics in ancient Hellenistic astrology. That is the earliest era of horoscopic astrology. And so if you don't know a lot about the different schools of astrology, Hellenistic astrology is going to be the kind of astrology that you see a lot of astrologers practicing nowadays. It's become more popular in the last 30 years or so. Um, and that is due to the fact that a lot of ancient texts with some of the original techniques of uh, horoscopic astrologers were recently translated into the English language, and it's created this renaissance in terms of the use of ancient approaches to astrology. Um, I have a background in modern psychological, archetypal, and evolutionary astrology, and so of course I bring those things to the table, but the course is primarily focused on the excavation of ancient techniques and the spiritual philosophy that ancient astrologers also espoused. The closest thing that I can tell you to what that looks like is you know, ask to ask this question, do you resonate with the philosophy that you hear me take on my YouTube channel? If so, then you're going to love this course in terms of its philosophical and spiritual approach, because the spiritual approach to astrology that I teach is really at the heart of the program. Um, and that that's a big part of my life. I approach uh, astrology from a spiritual standpoint. It doesn't belong to one religion or one particular school of thought, but you will hear me talking about things like the soul, the belief in the transmigration of the soul. You'll hear me talk about the need to be soul-centered in our client approach to counseling in astrology. You'll hear me have an appreciation for psychological dimensions of astrology, but also ancient astrology is really very, very good at developing your predictive capacity. We talk about what kinds of predictions are appropriate, how to make appropriate predictions, how to be the right kind of astrologer for our clients without inducing any fear. Um, so there's a lot of care that goes into the development of this craft. But ancient astrology is really amazing when it comes to honing your predictive abilities. And then what you'll find is in this program, there's also a pretty significant emphasis on the psychological dimensions and client care. Anyhow, we go into the roots of ancient Hellenistic astrology and its techniques in this program, and the 30 classes are broken into modules. We work through uh, the history and philosophy. Uh, we work through um, planets, houses, signs, aspects, uh, essential and accidental dignities, and then we get into approaches to the delineation of natal charts. And then at the end of the program, almost a third of the program is dedicated to live client readings, where you're going to see me meet with a person and apply what we've been studying for an hour long reading. We take a break, we come back, and then we workshop. How did I do that? Why did I make these choices? How did I handle this or that that came up in the reading? And it becomes easily the favorite part for most students of the entire program, because by that point, you've got so much theory that you're really ready to see it put into action. We alternate those live client practice sessions with um, hands-on practice where students get to bring chart questions into class that we work on. 
And that's also something that most people really love. A lot of people will look at the curriculum and say, well, I already know planets, houses, and signs, and aspects, and dignities. But not if you haven't studied Hellenistic astrology, because the approach that ancient astrologers had to these topics is vastly different from the approach that modern astrologers take. So you will be, in a sense, relearning basic things in a brand new way. And I think a much more enriching, deep, and philosophically clear way. It's really nice to know the why behind things. This program and Hellenistic astrology in general is very good at helping you understand the why behind everything that we do. Also, um, it's really important to participate when you study astrology in a living lineage. So one of the reasons I don't let people jump ahead to my second or third year programs is because I want you to be entrained to a lineage, a particular way of doing things that comes from an astrologer who has a very living, busy, active practice and who has had teachers themselves. I think that's important for astrological learning. That's the model that my own learning take. And so that's what I really want students to take away from my programs. Anyhow, um, so all of that um, aside, the second year program focuses, after we build our understanding of the basic delineation techniques of birth charts, in year two, we move into timing techniques, which is all about when the karma of a birth chart is going to be active and expressing itself throughout the course of a lifetime. That's year two. Year three focuses on the development of counseling skills uh, at a much deeper level. And then we also have a one-year horary program, which is about the development of a very specific predictive technique that can be a really amazing tool to add to your kit. That is four years worth of training programs that we have. However, I want to mention that many people take our classes just for the sake, um, purely for the sake of their own personal growth. Taking these programs is very much like being taught how to utilize a technology that for yourself will be deeply useful for the rest of your life and maybe for close friends or family members around you. Many people come through our programs taking that benefit away. We'll study through all four years of our programs with no intention of being professional. This is their hobby. This is a spiritual tool that will have many, it will pay dividends over a long period of time. However, many people without the intention to practice come into our courses and discover that they're actually good at it and may end up reading for other people part-time. And then there are students who are deeply, intensely motivated to practice for other people. And it is not that our programs really make those people successful. They, our programs contribute to your development, but it really is that some people have a calling to practice professionally. And um, these programs are designed to give you all the tools you need to develop that confidence and to develop a really coherent set of tools and to entrain yourself to a lineage, which you can also develop your own um, unique style out of. So uh, those are some of the, you know, the kinds of people that take our programs, you might say. So the 30 classes on the year are then um, broken into modules. And in between modules, we have two course directors who are present in all of the classes and they lead breakout tutoring sessions where you can come in and review or ask questions about the module that we've just completed, which is usually anywhere between two and three classes each. So those breakout study sessions led by our tutors are outside of the 30 classes and very useful. A lot of people like to attend those because they also offer opportunity for community and just lively conversation. We also have 12 online webinar classes led by guest teachers that we host throughout the year. Those are free. And if you can't make them live, they're all um, uploaded into your student folder. You also have an interactive group forum discussion staffed with tutors who typically respond to questions that you have about the material within 24 hours. So if you can't attend a tutoring session or you just have a random question on a Tuesday night, you can pop it in there and you'll get an answer. Um, we also have a ton of bonus material, optional quizzes, flashcards, tons of supplemental material that is there to help people go as deeply as they want. We have a reading list that is expansive. And that reading list, we don't expect anyone to accomplish. It's more so a resource that we give you saying, here, if you want to know all the things I've read, if you want to know all the things that I love, if you want to know all the things I recommend, here's a master list of everything for each lesson. You could go, you know, PhD level if you wanted to and read thousands and thousands of pages. Or you might find that there's just one extra book that looks really interesting and you want to pick it up. But we pride ourselves on making sure you have a ton of resources. You have lifetime access to all the class recordings. You can email our staff or me throughout the year with questions, and uh, my staff will also defer to me in the case that they don't know the answer to a question. 
So that is what the program includes. It starts November 16th. If you would like to join at the bottom between now and October 15th, our early bird payments are available. So that saves you some money off the cost of the course. There is a 12 month installment plan that is cheaper than our normal plan, a one-time payment plan that a one-time payment that's uh, significantly cheaper than our normal one-time payment. So you get these little sales that we do until October 15th. We also have need-based tuition assistance. So if you are someone who would like to take this program, but you are on a fixed or tight budget, uh, we have a, a, um, an application there. Click apply now. Just tell us what you need. We, we give a range. We say between this dollar amount and this dollar amount, what can you spend? And then we set you up with a plan for that tuition number per month. And that is available for anyone. We ask people to apply early because um, those spots are limited, but um, we are really accommodating. We try to make sure that nobody's priced out of a, um, some, a spiritual education. Like this topic should be very accessible for people because um, I believe that the divine is speaking through the sky and like anyone should have access to understanding what it's saying. Right. So anyway, um, that is a bit about the program. I hope that this has been useful for you. If there are any questions you have, you can look over the curriculum content on the page on the year one uh, page. There's more information there. Check out the FAQ section for more questions. Email us info at nightlightastrology.com. And I hope to see some of you in class soon. I think this is going to be a really powerful program because it's also starting right as Pluto's moving into Aquarius. And within the year, we're going to have a Uranus Pluto trine with Uranus in uh, Gemini, these airy signatures and the connection between Uranus and Pluto make for a very powerful year to advance our understanding of astrology. So it's a great election year for studying. And I hope to see some of you in class soon.